Praise the Lord, family. Night three of revival to God be the glory. Night three of revival. Whether you have been with us all week long or if this is your first night uh, joining us, we welcome you wherever you are from. Go ahead and uh, represent your city, represent your state. Type that into the comments as we celebrate God and as we pray over wherever you are. May God bless you and your family. Are you guys excited about what God is going to say and do tonight? Have you been enjoying the throwback uh, as it relates to the musical part of our uh, worship? I pray that God has been speaking to you about that. If you haven't been with us, we have been going into the vault, as Dr. Lynch said, for the musical portion. Uh, but Dr. Faison has been blessing and moving and speaking to our hearts and speaking to our minds with a fresh, uh, relevant right now word for the people of God. As a matter of fact, we want to encourage you. Now is the time for you to like uh, the page. Now is the time for you to share this worship. And what I want you to do, I want you to tag about five people uh, tonight and ask them to come on in the room uh, for this last night of revival. Dr. Lynch, have you been excited about I revival? I've been excited. God is moving in such a powerful way. Amen. So listen, as you tag your friends and your family members, as we have been saying all week long, we come into worship with expectation uh, that God is going to have his way in our lives. God is going to move. Did you come in tonight uh, with an expectation? Y'all know how we do. Type that in. Proclaim that out loud that I've come in with an expectation. Type expectation in right now uh, because we are trusting and believing God to move in an amazing way. Come on in. I see uh, the numbers are shooting up across the platform. Everybody is coming in for this last night of revival. All of our pastor friends out there, may God bless you. All of our sister churches that are out there, may God bless you. And everybody, I see all of the cities being represented, Doc, all of the states uh, being represented. We welcome you all into this last night of revival. We're excited about what God is going to do. Can we pray together? I'm gonna pray, uh, uh, we wanna pray together as we ask God to continue to move in our revival service. God, we love you. We thank you, we adore you. God, we thank you so much, Father God, for all of the sisters and brothers from across the land who have come um, to join us tonight in revival. God, in this last night of revival, I pray in the name of Jesus that you will break uh, every chain. I pray, Father God, that um, strongholds will be destroyed. I pray, Father God, that you will uh, speak with us with, with clarity, Father God, that through the preached word, that through the scripture, that we hear from you in a unique, unique way uh, that, like never before. I pray, uh, Father God, that as we close out this revival, that we are better. We are better uh, individuals. We are better uh, husbands. We are better uh, wives. We are better friends. We are better as singles. We are better as seniors. We are better as students. I pray uh, that we are just better in the name of Jesus. I pray uh, that we become a better church. Uh, uh, we better serve. I pray that at the end of this revival that we will be better, Father God, so much so uh, that we are uh, sure to one day hear you say, well done. Oh God, we come before you, everything that is on our hearts and our minds uh, that has been weighing us down. We are, we are presenting them and we are casting them before you. We are laying our burdens down at this altar, Father God. We have come into this place trusting and believe, God, that you will move like only you can. And Lord, when it's all said and done, Father God, we'll be careful to give your name all of the glory, give your name all of the honor, and give your name all of the praise. It is in the powerful name of Jesus, the people of God say together, amen, amen, amen. amen. As we continue to worship God through giving, we want to remind you uh, that part of our worship experience is being faithful to God as it relates to what he has called us to do. Uh, one of the things that God has called us to do is to serve. Each and every night, we've been reminding you of our mandate to serve, our mandate to serve the lost, the least, and the left out, our mandate uh, to stand in the gap uh, as it relates to social justice issues, our mandate uh, to stand in the gap as it relates to all of the things that are not right in our 
society. The only way that we serve, the only way that we stand in the gap, the only way uh, that we do missions like we do missions here is because of you. For those of you who've never been with us, we are a church that is very intentional as it relates to our mission efforts. A significant portion of our budget is focused on missions. A significant portion of our budget is focused on service. We're not a, church, a perfect church. We know that there are areas that we have to be better in. We know that we have to continue to shift as it relates to serving in this pandemic. But I will tell you this, as it relates to missions, God has used us in a, in a great way as it relates to serving this community. Uh, as it relates to, as we've been talking about all week, uh, I'm excited, Dr. Lynch, that we fed over 7,000 people right here in the city uh, of Charlotte. I'm excited that we continue uh, to just reach out to brothers and sisters. And the only way we do that is by what you do. So on this last night of revival, what I'm going to ask you to do is allow the Holy Spirit to be your guide tonight as it relates to giving. Whether you've never been with us before, you have an opportunity to give, the information is on the screen. Uh, you have an opportunity to give through text to give, the number is there. You can certainly go to our website. Uh, however the Holy Spirit guides you, we want you to take this opportunity uh, to be obedient. The Bible reminds us that those of us who plant seeds generously will also reap a generous harvest. We're so grateful for you because that's the only way we've been able to do anything that we've ever done is by what you do through this moment. If you've never tried God before, I encourage you to try him tonight. If you've never uh, given before or planted a seed before, I encourage you to do so tonight because I'm telling you, it's still true. I think I've said it every night, Doc. You can't beat God's giving no matter how hard you try. Dr. Lynch. God has kept us focused on the one single scripture for our theme for this revival, Psalms 85, verse number six. Wilt thou not revive us again, that thy people may rejoice in thee? This has been an amazing two nights so far. This third night continues to lift us in anticipation, expectation. Dr. John Faison, the pastor, Watson Grove Baptist Church, Nashville, Tennessee, has been praying and has been listening and sitting at the feet of God as God has poured messages into his soul each night, and I'm sure again for tonight, that speak to where we are as families, as individuals, in the time in which we're living now. We thank God for him, his ministry. We ask God to continue to bless him. Let us move further now in our worship in this revival and hear from heaven. Like the dew in the morning, gently rest upon my heart. Like the dew.
You heard it earlier. I want to read it again. It is a pretty lengthy passage, a bit more than we're used to reading, but I believe the story is necessary to understand the movements and what God is trying to say. Ruth chapter 1, beginning at verse 6, from the New Living Translation, it reads this way. Then Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had blessed his people in Judah by giving them good crops again. So Naomi and her daughters-in-law got ready to leave Moab to return to her homeland. With her two daughters-in-law, she set out from the place where she had been living, and they took the road that would lead them back to Judah. But on the way, Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back to your mother's home, and may the Lord reward you for your kindness to your husbands and to me. May the Lord bless you with the security of another marriage. Then she kissed them goodbye, and they all broke down and wept. No, they said, we want to go with you to your people. But Naomi replied, why should you go on with me? Can I still give birth to other sons who could grow up to be your husbands? No, my daughters, return to your parents' home, for I'm too old to marry again. And even if it were possible and I were to get married tonight and bear sons, then what? Would you wait for them to grow up and refuse to marry someone else? No, of course not, my daughters. Things are far more bitter for me than for you, because the Lord has raised his fist against me. And again, they wept together, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye but Ruth clung tightly to Naomi look Naomi said to her your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods and you should do the same but Ruth replied don't ask me to leave you and turn back wherever you go I will go wherever you live I will live your people will be my people and your God will be my God wherever you die I will die and there I will be buried may the Lord punish me severely if I allow anything but death to separate us. When Naomi saw that Ruth was determined to go with her, she said nothing more. So the two of them continued on their journey. When they came to Bethlehem, the entire town was excited by their arrival. Is it really Naomi? The women asked. Don't call me Naomi, she responded. Instead, call me Mara. For the Almighty has made life very bitter for me. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me home empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has caused me to suffer and the Almighty has sent such tragedy upon me? So Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by her daughter-in-law, Ruth, the young Moabite woman. They arrived in Bethlehem in spring, in late spring, at the beginning of the barley harvest. This is the word of the Lord. Might the people of God say amen. Amen. I want to talk today with the Holy Spirit's guidance and with your prayers from the subject, Living with Loss living with loss living with with loss every change in the seasons of our lives that we experience require us to learn something every time life shifts every time anticipated or unexpected a season changes and every time we go through this kind of experience, we learn something. God requires us to learn something from that season. But beloved, my experience is, and it's probably your experience too, that the hardest seasons and the hardest changes, not just the ones that require us to learn something, but the ones that require us to lose something. See, nothing 
shakes us to our core, quite like loss. Loss. Separation of something important, something we believe perhaps to be essential. The loss of something important or someone important. Nothing gets to us quite like loss. It changes everything. Nothing is ever, again, the way we once knew it. In fact, if we're honest, this is one of the reasons why change bothers us so much. See, most of us realize that things have to change. Change is a normal and healthy and inevitable part of life. But the part about change that rocks our world is the fact that while change happens, we might lose something in the process. So, so we, don't, we don't really fear change. We actually fear loss. And each time we experience a loss in our lives to help us bounce back and to help us cope with the void that is now new in our lives, we often subconsciously train ourselves to hold on tightly to whatever it is so we, could, we won't lose something else again. When we lose something, what we, what we have, what remains, we hold on tightly to trying not to experience it again. And every time we think we're going to lose something else, we grab it tighter and tighter. Oh, beloved, there are some distinct truths I want to share with you today about loss that you and I have to accept if we're going to survive in this world. Here's the first one. Loss is inevitable. Can't get around it. You, you cannot avoid loss. I, I, I don't care how tightly you batten down the hatches. I don't care how tightly you nail your possessions and even the personalities in your life. You glue them to your scenario and your setting. Loss knows where you live. And loss will visit you even though you did not send out any invitations. We live in a temporal world, but we want to exercise eternal control. But loss will show up to find you. Your address may not be listed, but loss will come see you. You may not have your phone number nationally publicized, but loss will call you. Loss will find you right where you are. And, this, and if this pandemic has taught us anything, it has reminded us just how out of control we really are just how inevitable loss is and just how you and I are subject and susceptible to its presence. You've you got to understand loss is inevitable. You can't avoid it. But you also have to understand this second distinct truth, and that is this. When you experience loss, you don't just get over it. Oh, I know. I know you, 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 you may be privy uh, and influenced by a popular culture that tells you just suck it up and move on and just keep it uh, uh keep keep things going and, and 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 it'll be fine but if you've ever really lost something special or perhaps even someone special you know that loss lingers it doesn't just just happen one day and then go away no 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 loss will come visit you at the most inopportune times that's because wherever loss shows up her twin sister grief is also attached whenever you deal with a season of loss you can always always expect grief to be a part of the journey and just when you think you've gotten past it you bump into something that reminds you of the loss and there you go again just when you thought you had moved past it beyond it gotten over it and everything was cool you smelt something familiar you walked into a room and got reminded you saw a face and it triggered some grief in your soul because when you go through loss you don't just get over it it takes time but beloved, our perspective of loss, here's the good news, our perspective of loss is different from God's perspective of loss. See, for you and I, for us, loss is trouble. It's trying. It's tragedy. But in the hands of an almighty God, loss can become a tool. I said it too fast, I'll say it again. I, 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 I said God's perspective of loss is a little different than ours. That's why you got to stay connected to God because God will give you perspective and a different vantage point from which to view your scenario and your experience in life. For us, loss is just trouble, tragedy, and tribulation. But for God and in God's hands, loss can become a tool. That's why, that's why you got to let God lead you, especially in seasons of loss because, beloved, there is 
is no season of our lives in which God's power cannot be seen. There is no moment you'll ever encounter where God's authority and God's presence cannot be experienced and felt. So then, while loss threatens to stop us, God can use loss to shift us. While, 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 while loss threatens to stop us and to paralyze us in our tracks, God can use that loss to propel us to where God wants us to be. That, in fact, is really the genius of God. That every loss and even loss can have redemptive possibilities for our journey when we let God lead us. Why, why, beloved? Why, why is this important? This is important because you got to get this. You got to get this principle about God. You got to know. I say it often. I say it regularly. But I need you to accept it, chew it, and digest it. That your God is not pulling things together on the off the hip and on the fly. God is strategic. God is in. God doesn't play games. God builds strategy and structure and he has things happening in ways that he understands even if we don't understand. So then when God shifts us from one season to another, when God allows loss to take place in our lives, you got to know God is not just taking us from something, but God is actually taking us to something. It, 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 is, it is not God seeking to punish you and relegate you to a life of grief and angst and anxiety. It is really God taking you from one place because he's got another place that he's trying to get you to. So the loss then we experience is actually an invitation from God to find out what's next. Every loss that happens in our lives, hear me today, every loss that occurs in our lives is actually a divinely embroidered, specially made, custom arranged and designed invitation for you and I to find out what's next. But the key to handling any season of loss is to find the resilience to keep progressing to see what God has next. You cannot let loss eliminate your vigor and your your desire to keep living you've got to keep functioning you've got to keep moving you've got to keep progressing so that you get from where you are to where God wants you to be and, and, and beloved beloved today Ruth is a, a rather appropriate case study for us uh, the, the story of Ruth uh, is a powerful one when you get a chance make sure you read the whole book it's only about four chapters or so it's not long but it's a powerful story that I promise will speak to you and will impact your outlook on what it means to live with loss beloved the book of Ruth begins with a man named Elimelech and Elimelech marries a sister named Naomi they are living in Judah and things are going well until all of a sudden a famine strikes and and they leave Judah and they go to Moab where the crops are better. While they are there, they have two sons, a son named Malon and a son named Kilion. They escape the famine, move to Moab, and their boys grow up. And while they grow up, they end up marrying Moabite women. They marry some sisters named Orpah and a sister named Ruth. Things seem to be going well there in Moab. Life makes sense. Life is prosperous and successful for all of them. The entire family is doing well when all of a sudden the bottom falls out for this particular family. And the Bible says Elimelech dies. Not only does Elimelech die making Naomi a widow, but the Bible also says that eventually Malon and Kilion die as well. So now the patriarch of the family and the two men remaining in the family have passed away. Now there's only Naomi, Orpah, and Ruth and they've got to figure out what life is going to look like after loss. Now let me explain to you a little bit of Old Testament context in this particular passage and in this particular historical context without a man in the family these sisters were really considered property and castaways. They could not own property. They could not make decisions about what they had and they they were believed to be now stuck and stagnant and these sisters have to figure out what life is going to look like next now when we read the book of Ruth you've heard you've read it and you probably heard it preached before but when we have what we have done often is turn the story of Ruth into a love story with Boaz as the leading character you 
probably heard it, this preached before, heard it shared, and all you hear about is Boaz, Boaz, Boaz. Let me help you. This is not the book of Boaz, beloved. It is the book of Ruth. And by making Boaz the star, you'll mess around and miss the lessons that these sagacious sisters are trying to teach us. See, this tendency speaks to our need often to have a male provider in order to celebrate female presence. I don't have time to deal with that today, but the real story of Ruth is about how a Moabite sister overcomes patriarchy, pain, loss, and grief in order to start her life over again. And with the wisdom and the nuanced perspective of her sagaciously savvy mother-in-law, she walks into her new season of productivity and power. And it all started because after a season of loss, no matter how hard it got, she kept on living. I'm talking to somebody who's listening to me today and you're on the verge of giving up. You're on the verge of saying, you know what? I'm about through. I'm about finished with this. Listen, COVID-19 simply pushed me over. Before COVID got here, I was already stressed out. I was already angry. I was already dealing with challenges and stuff that I didn't know how to navigate and questions I didn't have answers to. And now I find myself isolated and separated and I can't do what makes sense for me. I can't gather like I used to. I can't connect the way I used to. I don't have the opportunity to fellowship with my church family. I can't even go to the family reunion. The graduations got canceled and the weddings got canceled. I got to go to the graveside to go to funerals. It doesn't make sense to me. I got to wear a mask and a uniform just to go get groceries and to go outside and it's getting on my last nerve. I'm on the verge of saying forget this. I want to talk to you today because I need you to know even with losses that are mounting again and again higher and higher you got to make a decision to remain resilient and to keep living even in the midst of time and space that doesn't make sense you got to know God still has something in store for you but you'll never get to see it if you quit where you are can I tell you today there's some people who are watching me that know what it means to live with loss and know what it means to live through loss they would tell you even if you lose something you ain't gotta lose yourself even if you lose some stuff that meant a lot to you go ahead and grieve go ahead and mourn but keep going whatever you do because there's something God has on the other side here it is. Here it is. How, how then? How then do I progress and keep living with loss? I want you to grab your notebook. You need your. You need. Your, you need to take some notes today. There are four things I got to give you. Four. You know it's special if I got four points. Four things I want to give you today that I hope will help you to understand what it means to live with loss. Here's the first thing you got to do. If you're gonna live with loss, you got to learn to make some important choices. You got to make some important choices. See, before we can ever get to where we're going, we have to make some decisions about where we are. What, what, watch what happens to these characters, Naomi, Oprah, and Ruth. Watch what happens to them. Naomi is widowed. She has lost both sons and her husband, and now she has her two daughters-in-law. Watch her make a decision. Verse 6, Bible says she decides to leave Moab and return to Judah. Judah is her homeland, Bethlehem. She gets there because she goes because good crops have returned there, and she sees the potential for a better life there. She made a choice. I'm going back home. There's another sister there, her daughter-in-law named Ruth, and Ruth is widowed. She's lost her husband and she has no son. She makes a choice too. Verses 16 and 17 say this, that Ruth decides to stay with Naomi and then Naomi can't even talk her out of sticking around. Wait a minute, there's another sister. Her name is Orpah and Orpah is widowed and again has no sons but in verse 14, Orpah makes a choice and a decision. Bible says she decides to leave Naomi and Ruth and to go back to her home in Moab. Watch this. Each of these women made choices that they believed was best for the season they were in. See, they have all experienced tremendous loss and they are all living with that loss, but they decide to make choices about their lives to move forward, but they don't do it, here's the point, the same way. All of them make different decisions. Naomi and Ruth are deciding to go back to Judah together, but Orpah returns to her homeland in Moab. Can I tell you, never do we hear, not one time, Naomi or Ruth demonize 
criticizing Orpah for making a choice that's different than theirs. We also never hear Orpah disparaging the choices that Naomi and Ruth make as well. They each do what they believe their season requires. Can I pull you to the window real quick? Because too often we allow what others say to impact the choices we have to make about the seasons that we're in. But here's the thing. You better learn to make your own choices and you better learn to make your own decisions right long through here in a season like this because at the end of the day regardless of what they have to say they are not the ones who got to live with the consequences of those choices so you better go ahead and make your own decisions survey your situation look at what you have and respond accordingly see often if we don't let other people dictate our decisions we'll be on the other side and then when somebody else makes a decision about their lives we want to critique and offer commentary on the decisions that they made about the season they were in oh don't look at me with that tone of voice you know I'm talking to you you know how we do it girl if I was you this is what I'd do bruh if I had your hand this is how I would play it let me help you be real careful evaluating decision that someone else makes based upon a season you've never been in be real careful about offering critical commentary about what somebody else ought to do and you're looking from the outside in you don't know what it's like to walk in those shoes you don't know what it's like to live in that house you don't know what it's like to go to that job every day let people make the decisions that they need to make because they got to deal with the consequences beloved if you're going to live through loss you got to make some important choices here's number two if you're going to live through loss you also here it is you got to maneuver through some creative identities I said, if you're going to live through loss, you got to understand that, you, that, that, that it's necessary to learn to maneuver through some creative identities. Beloved, when seasons change, they often call for us to redefine who we are. They cause us to look at life through a different lens. And Naomi is an example. Ruth is an example. The Bible says Naomi is a widow. Ruth is a widow. Neither of them have ever been such before. It's a new space. They are widows in a time when their values were determined by the men in their lives, their husbands and their sons. And now they have neither. Can I tell you, this new identity is extremely foreign to them, but it also at the same time provides a certain level of freedom for them. Think about it. For the first time, they get to determine where they go. For the first time, perhaps, they get a chance to discover what lies before them. For the first time, perhaps ever, they get a chance to engage in life from a new perspective. Seasonal changes that make us experience loss force us to redefine what life means. And often, when our definitions have changed, those monikers we've placed upon ourselves and those identities that make sense to us and are comfortable and convenient for us, when those begin to shift, we often begin to question who we are. I'm talking to you. I say, yeah, we begin to question who we are. We begin to wonder, do we really still have significance? We begin to wonder, do, do I really still matter because I'm not who I used to be or I don't have the title or the label that I used to have? Beloved, I want you to know when your definition changes, it does not mean your destiny has changed. When, when identities begin to shift, it does not mean that God claims you or calls you illegitimate in some form or fashion. There is still greatness inside of you there is still greatness in front of you but it might require you to see it in a way that you've never seen it before beloved you gotta know that some of the labels and the identities that we enjoy are the ones that society culture and people have placed upon us and they may not necessarily be the ones God has placed upon us I need you to know you are more than how people identify you you are more than the labels that society has cast upon you and it might be time to discover what else lies in you that you could not see if the loss had not taken place in your life can I tell you sometimes loss comes to give birth to stuff that's been dormant in our souls for too long sometimes God pulls away what we've been leaning on so we discover that our legs are strong enough to stand by ourselves sometimes God takes away what's comfortable and what we depend on so we can see God was all we ever needed in the first place Got to maneuver through some creative identities. Here, here's number three. Here's number three. When you're living with loss, you got to move through chaos towards improvement. 
I need you to get that. I need you to get that every word. And that, and that point makes, makes sense and is significant. You got to move through chaos towards improvement. Why is that important? That's important because the greatest temptation in a season of loss is to shut down. Yep, talking to you. The greatest temptation when life seems to go to hell in a handbasket and loss seems to visit your house in a way you didn't expect it to, the greatest temptation is to shut down. So say, forget it. I don't want to play no more. Turn into a four-year-old on the playground. Pick up our ball and go home. I don't want to do this no more. And as the chaos mounts, checking out becomes more and more tempting. Pain can paralyze us. Loss can make us become emotionally lethargic. It gets hard to get out of bed. It gets hard to shower and put fresh clothes on. You had them pajama pants on for three days. It gets hard to move and do something different because the loss is so debilitating. Beloved, but if we let the chaos of the loss shut us down, I want you to know things don't get better. They're going to get worse. Not, not, not only will you experience loss, you'll get lost. You'll find yourself unrecognizable. Wake up one day and you don't know who you are anymore. You'll find yourself in the fetal position in the bathroom, on the floor, trying to figure out how did I get here. Love it? You can get through and live with loss if you don't get lost. If you don't let loss suck out the life from you if you don't let loss pull you away from the things God is calling you to and how do you do it one of the ways you do it is you keep moving you keep pushing you keep living and, 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 and not just moving because you know you can be moving and still in the same place but you engage in movement which means you're going somewhere you're aimed in a direction you are focused on a, a an objective that is pulling you towards it it's not just moving it's movement towards something watch the text naomi and ruth decide we're heading to judah i told you they're going to judah because the famine is in moab but good crops have returned to judah and they are going but please know while they're going they don't leave their grief in moab their grief comes with them because I don't care where you go if you lost something that lost stays it sticks around and it lingers they, 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 they are grieving and dealing with real loss matter of fact Naomi is so is so fed up and so sick of this sick I mean sick of it all sick and tired of being sick and tired she's so bad she decides she's gonna change her name she gets down to Judah and they throw her at her high school uh, high school reunion they're, they're looking for Naomi and they're excited that she's coming back home and and, and she says they, they, they say there's Naomi right there and she said don't call me Naomi Call me Mara. Mara in Hebrew means bitterness. She, she, decla she declares that God has raised his fist against her. She got an attitude. That thing is upset. She is beside herself with grief, confusion, and anger. And guess what? She got every right to be. She's lost her husband. She's lost her two sons. Everything that made sense to her has been stripped from her but here's what I need you to get while she has an attitude she's still active she's grieving she's hurting but she's still going to Judah she's mourning but still moving she's steaming mad but still stepping she's not going to let even her own emotions cancel out her willingness to go to where she has a possibility of a better future beloved can i tell you this is where god wants you and i now, he, he didn't say don't feel what you feel he didn't say don't process the grief that you deal with but even while you grieve figure out a way to keep putting one foot in front of the other even while you're hurting and smarting from the losses that are mounted in your life you cannot let them get you stuck and stagnant where you are God says if I can trust you to keep moving then I can get you where I need you to be if I can trust you to keep going I can get you to the spot I've destined and designed for 
for your life. I don't know who I'm talking to today, but I came to tell you, you don't need to know where you're going. You just need to get up like you're going. You don't necessarily need to know everything that's happening. You just need the energy and the courage to put your clothes on, put your shoes on, and give some effort to keep moving right where you are. If you'll take one step, Big Mama said, Great God will take two. If you'll use what you have, God will give you what you don't have. If you'll keep moving, God has something for you. I'm almost done. Here it is. Here's number four. Here's what happens. Here's what happens. If you learn how to live with loss, you got to make some important choices. You, 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 you've got to maneuver through some creative identities. You got to move through chaos towards improvement. But here's what will happen. If you'll decide to not quit while you're living with the loss, God will do something so powerful on the other end that you never thought it was possible. If you'll keep moving towards the improvement, here's what will happen. Number four, you will meet those whose destiny is interconnected you, you 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 will on your journey meet some folks whose destiny is interconnected i just told you when we started this little presentation that god when he shifts us and takes us through seasons of loss he doesn't just take us from something but he takes us to something so then when naomi and ruth leave moab the bible says they return to judah and on their way it is not just a simple journey i need you to know they didn't just call the uber and make it from moab to judah no no that's not how it works they actually had to travel and go through some terrain shifts in order to get from moab to judah it's not a simple journey to get from moab to judah at this time they got to go around the Dead Sea after they go around the Dead Sea they possibly now have to go through one of the lower ends of the Jordan River even while they travel it's two sisters traveling by themselves and they are going to be targets for bandits and predators on the way so they have to travel vigilantly even while they grieve and they go they got to go from one place to the next too fast one more time okay uh, Naomi and Ruth are leaving Moab and heading to Judah in order to get there they got to go around the Dead Sea they got to go through the Jordan River they got to travel vigilantly knowing that bandits and predators are along the pathway and they've got to deal with their own grief and their own mourning and regardless of how long the travel takes here's what happens the Bible says they arrive during the season of the barley harvest you miss your shout. I'll give it to you one more time. Naomi are leaving, Naomi and Ruth are leaving Moab, going down to Judah. In order to get there, they got to go around the Dead Sea. They got to go through the Jordan River. They've got to travel vigilantly, knowing that bandits and predators are along the path. And they've got to deal with grief and loss and mourning on the way. But regardless of how long the journey takes, they take the journey and they arrive at the time of the barley harvest. Can I tell you, when they get to Jerusalem, get to Bethlehem rather at the time of the barley harvest Ruth then starts serving with the harvesters in the field but the field she walks into at the time she arrives belongs to a gentleman named you got it Boaz now Boaz owns many fields he owns several of them he's a pretty wealthy man but he comes to visit the field during harvest at the same time that Ruth has just showed up from her journey from Moab down to Judah her timing coincides with Boaz's timing that while Ruth was coming from somewhere to here God was positioning Boaz on the other end to be there at the same time she shows up can I tell you if Ruth and Naomi get stuck in their feelings Ruth is going to miss her appointment in the field if they don't leave Moab at the time they leave if they get delayed in any capacity they miss what is critical for the next season of their lives but because they kept moving and they kept living even while navigating loss they ended up getting connected with the one whose destiny was connected to theirs here's what you got to know about God God isn't just arranging your life God is arranging the lives of people that he's going to strategically connect with you but it only happens if you keep going and get to the spot where the intersection is supposed to take place you think that if you quit and give up it only affects you the devil is a liar I need you to know that your life is so important that it's connected and intertwined and intersecting into other lives and into other destinies and you gotta play your part so that they can play theirs and ultimately when y'all get together because you didn't quit beautiful things 
things are going to happen. Purpose is going to take place. Destiny will be revealed and you will fulfill the will of an almighty God. But you can't quit where it gets tough because you're going to miss your destiny. You, you, you think I made that up? I didn't make that up. Uh, uh, Ruth and Naomi end up getting to Bethlehem and Ruth ends up meeting Boaz. If you know the story of Ruth and Boaz, you know the rest of this, that Ruth and Boaz end up getting married and they end up having children. Ruth and Boaz end up giving birth to a boy named Obed. If you ever think that your decisions and your choices don't impact others' destiny and purpose, you ought to pay attention to Ruth and Boaz. I told you, they get married and they give birth to a boy named Obed. But then Obed grows up and Obed gives birth to a son named Jesse. Jesse grows up and Jesse gives birth to a son named David. David grows up. And becomes one of the most successful kings Israel has ever seen. He unites the northern and the southern kingdom. But he also sets in place lineage to come. That down some 40 and 2 generations. Some 14 generations after David. There is another baby that's born. In the same place called Bethlehem. Reared in Nazareth. Laid in a manger. Wrapped in swaddling clothes. And you know his name. His name is Jesus. Jesus then becomes the descendants of an obedient sister who decided to keep living with her loss. If Ruth decides to check out on life, we don't ever get to see Jesus being born in that manger wrapped in swaddling clothes and ultimately becoming the savior of our world. I gotta go today. I just came to tell somebody that while you think checking out on life is going to make you feel better, while you think that dealing with your loss and checking out and giving up is going to make things better for you. I came to tell you that's the devil whispering in your ear trying to make you miss the appointment of your purpose. See the devil knows that there's something greater in your future and he wants you to quit right now so you'll never get to that place. But I came by the power of the Holy Ghost today to tell you that you gotta keep living with your loss even when it's difficult and there are tears in your eyes so much purpose is tied in to who God made you to be and if you won't quit God will open doors in your life if you won't quit God will make a way in your life if you refuse to give up on God God, you will discover that God never gave up on you. Is there anybody talking, listening to me today that can testify? I'm glad I didn't give up when I felt like throwing the towel in. I'm glad I didn't let my life come to a premature end. Because if you trust and you never doubt, God will surely bring you out is there anybody listening to me today that can testify with authority that God has more in store for what I can't see God has more determined for my future God has more in store if I keep on pressing and keep on running and keep on walk it God will reveal it in time God has something great in store for you and eyes have not seen that ears have not heard neither has it entered into the heart of man what God has in store for you I just came to tell you you can't quit you can't give up you can't it. You might have to lay down, but get up again and keep on going. Because after a while, by and by, I'm a witness. God will make a way somehow. If you know he'll do it, if you know that he can, do me one favor. Right in your living room, right in your bedroom, lift your hand. 
church, open up your mouth and say, I will live and not die. Come on, you said it too weak. Say it again. I will live and I will not die. Come on, one more time. Put your hands on your chest and say it with your chest. I will live and not die. I will see the salvation of the Lord in the land of the living. He's been too good for me to throw it in right now. He's been too faithful for me to quit right now. I've lost something, but I will live. I left something, but I will live. I'm missing something, but I will live and step into my destiny. If you're going to do it, say yes, say yes, say yes. I will live and not die. I won't let loss take me out. I won't let trouble make me cancel my commitment and my connection to my God. There's too much in front of me to turn around now. God is going to make a way if you'll stay eligible for him to make a way. How do you stay eligible? Keep on living. Keep on going. Ruth will testify. All I thought I was doing was saving my own life. What I didn't know was that I was setting the stage for salvation to come into the world. If I got stuck in Moab, Jesus might not have been able to come the way he came. Because Ruth refused to quit, God used her temerity and her stick to to become the foundation for God bringing a savior into the world. Living with loss. Did God speak to you today? Can we, can we celebrate God right where we are? Amen. To God be the glory for an amazing way uh, to close out this worship experience. God has been speaking all week long. And for some of you, he started speaking to you before tonight. But in reality, what you heard tonight was uh, confirmation. Now we're asking you to respond to whatever God has been saying to you. Whether that is recommitting, whether that's reconnecting, whether that's releasing, whatever God is saying to you, our responsibility is to serve you by helping you to respond to what God is saying. How does the church help you to respond to what God is saying? One of the ways that we do that is connecting with you. So what we need you to do is send us a message in the inbox or go to our website and send us a message there and let us know what God is saying. If God is speaking to you about a church home, a place where you can grow, Scripture reminds us that we are many members of one body. You have a gift, and if God has been speaking to you about using that gift, we want to connect with you. If God has been speaking to you because you've just been dealing with something and you just need some, some care, you need some pastoral counseling, you need some professional counseling, whatever you're standing in need of, we want to talk to you as well. If God has been speaking to you because you need to, make a, to be recommitted, you had a relationship with God, but life happened, some things happened to you and you got disconnected. And if God is speaking to you about that, we want to help you. And if you're that sister or brother who, 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 who's maybe not a believer, maybe you've never confessed in accordance with scripture, we certainly want to talk to you and let you know that you're like everybody else. God didn't send you here by accident. God didn't send you here by co co coincidence. God brought you here because he wanted to speak to you and let you know how much uh, he loves you. Tonight, I want to do what I often do on Sunday. I, if you have a relationship with God, just type in yes in the comments. Say yes, this is a confession of faith that I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I believe that he died for my sins. I believe that he shall soon return. If you uh, have that relationship, type in yes. Perhaps there's somebody out there right now you don't know for sure 
or you couldn't type in yes. We want to connect with you. We want to help you to understand that God has a perfect plan for your life. We thank God for this revival. We pray that it was a blessing to you. May God bless you. May God keep you. And may heaven smile upon you. We join tonight for our closing prayer. This revival has been a powerful experience. Let us in your home and virtually connect now as we talk with our Father. Master, we are so appreciative of your Holy Spirit pouring into this revival preacher these powerful messages to help transform our souls, lift our lives, refocus. Help us, Master, now to live out what you have deposited within us. We pray a blessing upon every home. We pray a blessing upon every family. We pray a blessing on our sister churches that are watching with us. We ask God that as we move forward during these turbulent times, your Holy Spirit would guide us step by step and day by day. Thank you for Dr. Faison. Thank you. Renew him, bless his family, bless his home, bless his ministry. And now unto him who is able to keep us from falling, present us on that day with great joy. Be dominion, power, glory, henceforth, now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. God bless. Go in peace. Thank you for joining us in this revival.